Welcome to our next session on the intelligent industry stage. Let's talk about demystifying the battery path. Um, the next panel will discuss solutions and potentials behind an upcoming regulation. So let me welcome Veronika Kapel from Siemens Business Development Battery Pass App, Frank Schnieke from Fraunhofer, and my colleague Christian Föll. Sorry. So, first of all, thanks, Lydia, for this great introduction. And I have the great honor to welcome Veronika and Frank, who are uh, willing to participate here in this panel discussion. Um, before I give a short introduction into the topic and also to myself, I want to give my guests this chance to introduce themselves. So, Veronika, do you want to start? Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks. Very happy to be here. So I'm Veronica Karpiel. I'm the business development manager within the Siemens Battery Passport product team within Battery Solutions. Um, what I do is basically deliver our product to our customers. I talk to lo a lot to our customers and I also kind of mirror their requirements back to our product team. And of course, uh, I'm on occasions like this one here representing our Siemens Battery Passport team. Great. Thanks. Perfect. My name is Frank Schnicke, and I'm leading the department on digital twin engineering at the Fraunhofer Institute for Experimental Software Engineering. And one technology that we're focusing on that we also see a very big, let's say, potential for the battery pass is the asset administration shell. My department there focuses on delivering scalable solutions that can also be applied in the mission critical area. So, for example, for automating production. And one key asset that we are developing there is Eclipse Basics, which is an open source software for getting started with asset administration shells. Great, thank you. And my name is Christian. I'm, I have more than eight years uh, consulting experience in intelligent industries and focusing on digital twin. And I'm really looking forward to this panel discussion and what great insights we will share with you. So first of all, what is the battery pass? So the battery pass is one of the uh, European Commission legal uh, uh, restriction and requirement to share data for every economic operator. They are, have the duty to share static data, which we see on the left side. So it's about general battery uh, information, but also like raw materials, like the composition of materials, but also where the battery is produced. And on the other hand, it's also about dynamic data, where digital twin comics, uh, topics come into place. And that makes the battery pass really special, because we want to have battery status information. We want to have like performance information about capacity and power, um, and also about the dura durability. And in the end, so what the European Commission is going at to like improve the whole circular economy and to, to make the battery itself and mobility more sustainable. The challenge, however, for the companies in the, in the end is that you need to have a full transparency across the whole supply chain and you have to provide data which in each of single step and also during the operation of the battery. And this is a quite complex topic. And when we look at the timeline at 2027, it's quite a challenge. So I'm glad that I have some experts who can probably give us a little bit of enlightenment to this topic. So first question to you, Frank. So we have seen there that the, the data are kind of complex and the European Commission already shared like what kind of data attributes uh, they want to see and mm -hmm. want to share. So what kind of technical solutions do you currently see on the market and who, where do you see the race about a possible solution in the future? Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of spoiled the answer already in my introduction, but uh, to go a little bit more into detail, I think a very important question that we have to answer if we think about how to implement the battery pass is do we take this law that we have to do it as an obligation? We have to do it anyways. So that means fulfilling it can be done theoretically by just sending an Excel sheet. Or do we see it as an opportunity? 
And if we see it as an opportunity, we need to think about what are the opportunities that the battery pass is delivering. And to my opinion, one of the biggest opportunities is, of course, to pass this along the supply chain in a format, ideally standardized, interoperable, that you can use for integrating directly in the, let's say, IT systems of my suppliers and vice versa, the companies that I'm supplying to. And this is exactly where I think the asset administration shell on its own is able to shine, because this is exactly what I just described. It's an interoperable, standardized data format, and there's right now an ongoing work to map all these different kind of attributes that are being described in this legislation into the asset administration shell, and thus enable passing along the battery pass along the supply chain, not an Excel sheet, but as really something that adds value. And to come to your question about the, let's say, what makes the race, especially in um, the international level, I think, again, the asset administration shell is on a very good path there. The concept itself is coming from Germany, but it is being driven into the European Union. There is a very high involvement of uh, also companies and entities in the Asian market, for example. And just to share one, one experience we had, um, at the start of the fair, there were lots and lots of uh, visitors from Asian countries at our booth, which we are all invited to, of course. And there we are showing asset administration shells. And they asked, what are you showing? We said, asset administration shell, do you know this? And they all said, yeah, standardized, we know this. What are you showing precisely using the asset administration shell? And also, I think if we take a look in the other direction, in the direction of the United States, then it's also being driven there into the markets by Manufacturing X, for example. Or that's at least the plan for now. Okay. So, and I think data ecosystems are a strong value there in these terms to make this possible. So, even though like there are a lot of attributes already declared that, uh, I still got the feeling, and also with talking to experts, that not everything is 100% clear. So, Veronica, so how do you deal with that kind of challenge and how do you deal at Siemens in the past with the, like this also partially not 100% clear requirements? Yeah. So we at Siemens, basically what we started off is we used initially the already existing requirements like the battery regulation, like the content guidance by Battery Pass EU. Um, and then, of course, uh, standards, um, as already explained. I mean, there's Katina X that has been setting standards for seamless data exchange, EDC connectors. There's standards uh, that are set by, uh, by the IDTA, DPP 4.0. So what we did is basically starting off as a basis with the already known standards. Then, of course, I mean, it's a very dynamic, uh, dynamic area, I would say. There's a lot of development. But we at Siemens, um, we are part of the majority of these ecosystems. So we kind of um, help and are part in the development of these standards. Um, an example would be uh, the technical data model, for example. There was no standard yet for it um, within these standards. So we have created one to, to really feed it back to the ecosystems again. Um, but basically what is important here to say is, as already has been mentioned, the, the collaboration here is key. So, so the, the battery passport cannot be solved by one entity alone. It's really about collaboration within ecosystems, such as the IDTA, such as Katina X, within the industry um, to get everyone really on board to, to, to implement the battery passport successfully. But maybe I derailed a bit, but coming back to, you, to your question, we learned uh, within the Siemens battery passport product team, we learned to be flexible and really adapt quickly. We basically learned the ability to adapt quickly to, the, to these developments um, and changes that are coming not only from, from uh, ecosystems, but also uh, from our customers, like their requirements that are evolving and developing. Uh, yeah, so we have to be flexible and, no. and quick in developing uh, a solution. Yeah, I think like the, the ability to be adaptable and flexible is one of the key uh, capability for modern companies in intelligent industry. But in the end, of course, it's also how like the framework sets and how the requirements are. So um, what do you think also need to happen right now, like in terms of collaboration, but also like from what do you wish from the European Commission that should happen right now to like further foresee the solution because we have this tough time schedule ahead 
Yeah, yeah. So, so we talk a lot uh, to customer on a on a daily, weekly basis. We talk to uh, to automotive OEMs, to battery manufacturers, to cell producers. What we mainly see is pressure. They're pressured, and and fair enough. Um, there should be <laughs> because, as you mentioned, in 2027, the the battery passport is due with 107 uh, data points um, that have to be delivered, and even earlier in 2025, um, they have to um, yeah show the carbon footprint of their of the battery um, and this needs to be validated by a third party so um, it's right around the corner um, the, the time is really there's not much time left basically so what what is really important is um, I mean we are we are developing a solution uh, our aim is to really make life easy easier for our customers we have actually been uh, showcasing our POC our proof of concept of the Siemens battery passport here at Hanover on Monday um, and uh, basically what we really, when we talk to our customers, what is really important is basically the activation of the supply chain. Everyone within the supply chain needs to be activated, needs to look into their systems, look at the requirements, what kind of data points are needed, what kind, what, which of these data points are within my systems or are even uh, produced uh, in, in my production or are created in my production. And then how can I best deliver these data points to the next person in the supply chain. So, so it's really about an, an, an activation of, uh, of everyone in the supply chain. Um, and yeah, we are, we are helping, we're aiming to help our customers to, to do that with our, with our product. Yeah. And I think that's also one of the key challenges to make it even possible because the battery pass is about the whole supply chain and it's the first, I would say, the first blueprint to make a digital twin possible within the whole supply chain. And um, I've already seen like lots of use cases to today and the past days at the Hannover Messe dealing with the asset administration shell, like making it possible at the booths at Gaia X, at IDTA, but also like other companies using it, deploying it, like having showcases. But I have still the feeling that we are not quite there yet. So there's like we are at the tipping point and I think there's there's the tipping point that soon there will be a standard how we exchange information cross company. So from your experience, Frank, so where do you see should the focus be on when, when we should make and what should happen to make the asset administration shell work and like seeing in a, in a large scale implementation? Mm -hmm. So what I see today in discussions is that very often there's the assumption that we have an asset administration shell, it's representing, for example, the battery pass, it's there and we pass it along the supply chain. But there is, in, in this assumption, there's a very important gap that needs to be addressed, and this is how does the data get into the battery pass? Because if I take a look at the typical systems that uh, our customers are using, then, of course, these systems do not typically support already asset administration shells. And if we say, for working with the battery pass, for fulfilling the legislation with the battery pass, you have to completely switch your systems, replace working and already paid for systems, then typically the companies will say, no, that's not the way to go. So I think what we need to focus on is really building this bridge of shifting or enabling this data to be represented as asset administration shells. And what I think there is a very important point is enabling existing systems like ERP systems, MES systems, to still keep this data because you can just migrate it. There are lots and lots of different systems interacting with the ERP systems. And if we just say, let's replace this ERP system with something that is AAS native, so to say, what about the other systems? Do we also have to migrate them? And then very quickly you end up with a Big Bang migration, which of course carries lots of risk and is very costly. And what I think instead is a feasible approach is that we say, keep the data where it is today, for now, and then create, let's say, wrappers or facades that enable you to provide the data as asset administration shell. And if then in future we have ERP systems, MES systems that natively deliver asset administration shells, we can switch the systems and still have the benefit today. Okay, so you talked about the future. So let's, let's have all, let's go into the future and see, okay, let's move to two years in the future. We have like an Im implementation ready. We have a standard ready. We have a nice technical solution. We are sharing the data across the whole supply chain. And my question is then, so, 
okay, what, what is beyond this like regulation topic? So I have the infrastructure ready, I have the standard ready, I can use it. So where do you see actually, and this is maybe a question for you, Veronica, um, where do you see actually more potential beyond this this uh, like legal regulatory? So where could you see the, the future use of this kind of technology? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question because right now when we talk to our customers, this regulatory requirement is seen as a, as a huge burden, right? Uh, but it can be actually an opportunity. Imagine having all of this data accumulated in one place, accessible by, by different entities that can really, like, you have a lot of possibilities for, for add-on features. And, and um, I mean, example, like the obvious ones, maybe, maybe to just state a few obvious ones, is um, purchasing decisions of customers, right? Having information on, on the battery that is in my car, knowing even dynamic data points that you have mentioned, like the state of health, state of charge. When we think about a second-hand market of uh, EVs, for example, right? This can really revolutionize purchasing decisions, but also helps out the automotive way and credibility, right? To really show when we talk about sustainability, circularity, to really show where does where do the materials come from that I have that I have in my that I use in my EV. So um, even if we uh, yeah if we look about the if we if we think about calculating residual value of a battery so so the opportunities are really really big uh, and we are talking uh, to customers I mean we're discussing a lot with customers about their requirements of course I mean we are offering this solution so of course we we are exchanging with customers on what potential add-ons and requirements would they need and we are as of today like really. Uh, um, really uh, working on developing add-on features that have really a lot of possibilities, that are endless with possibilities, basically. Um, but maybe to, to, to mention again, what is really important here is that we use standards that are set by the industry. And I mean, the AIS has been uh, explained quite well, uh, standards by Katina X. Um, it is really important that that groundwork that has been done already, that we use that to really make it make it interoperable, um, um, the add-ons, the, the solution itself as well. So this is, um, yeah, it's, I'm very exciting to see what comes out of it. But I definitely see a lot of potential. And uh, yeah. there's a lot of positive, uh, there's a lot of positive outcome, I think out of this great great potential and endless ideas sounds sounds great yeah. so maybe Frank also to you the question from <laughs> your experience in the research field so how do you see that and uh, have customers already approached you as an institute to see okay when I have to do it anyway what kind of other uh, possibilities do I have to make um, more out of it yeah, so we definitely have been approached and I think what is a very important point to understand is that the battery pass, it's, it's a huge step, but it's just a starting point. Because the technology, if we are using the asset administration shell, then we have a sound foundation for building additional use cases. And what I think is, is really the, the strength and the argument that in the end will drive home the asset administration shell as the standard is that it's easily extendable and thus a very nice starting point for adding up on this. And by using the standard, we can avoid this, let's say, pitfall that was been done in the past that each single use case on its own was a silo. That means you have two use cases, you implement a third one, it costs the same, regardless if you have these two use cases implemented or not. But if we take a look at the asset administration shell and how all these, let's say, extensible features are defined, then actually what happens is that the cost per use case is sinking because you don't build silos, but instead you have already a very well integrated solution and you have two use cases, you would like to implement a third use case and suddenly you realize that the data that I need for my third use case it's already there. It's already integrated in the asset administration shell because I have to do this by, call it a happy accident, for the other two use cases. And now the focus is on really what delivers value, and this is the application, and not doing the quote-unquote homework of integrating the data. And that's, as I said, to put it in a nutshell, it's really the question, is it an obligation or is it an opportunity? And I see it as a very big opportunity for getting started, setting up the infrastructure, doing it right, and then reaping long-term from what we set up there. Mm. So thanks, Frank. So they, I think they are just great words. So like 
just make this obligation as an opportunity and a chance to increase the impact in the intelligent industry. So let me, in the end, summarize the session. So, of course, we have legal restrictions there, and of course, we have high requirements on that, but we have solutions ready, we have standards ready, and of course, we have great partners ready to, to support in this great challenge. And when we see it as a challenge to, to not only obligate this kind of key requirement, but also like accelerate this to, to make even more value out of it, especially in, within intelligent industry, I think it's a great chance to make our world better. And I would thank you for participating here. So if you have any further questions on that to, to myself, to my colleague Frank, to, to Veronica, my colleague, and uh, you can of course approach the booth itself or um, oh, now. <laughs> what? We have time for questions. We, are, we have time for questions. Okay, <laughs> the good great. news is, so, so if there are questions in the audience, uh, let please give, let us know. Let me allow like one last word. So we have a survey oh. in terms of the, ba the battery pass and digital twin. I'm really happy to um, if you uh, fill out this summary and the survey. So uh, we let let around uh, a QR code. So and now. Uh, I think we all have time for some questions. We exactly, have time yeah. for questions, exactly. Yeah. Any questions from the group here? Otherwise, I will start with a question. Oh, there is one. There is you one. have one. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the presentation. So my question is about, um, do you think uh, the battery pass could help to extend the lifetime of batteries? So as uh, batteries nowadays, are, especially in the automotive industry, are only used for some years yeah. and the second life is in question so what do you think about that yeah so what i think at least from my perspective a very big issue in this um, market for for used electronic vehicles for example is that you're buying the cat in the back yeah you have, you have no idea what you're getting because you have no idea what has been done with this car what has been done with this battery and in of course this this issue somehow also persists for the standard cars but in the standard car, there, there is not something like a battery which is more or less so insanely expensive to replace and which will break sooner than a motor, for example. And thus, I think, again, for this, it's also a chance. It's a chance from a different perspective, but it's a chance. If I, if I could just add here, definitely, I also see, see it as a big chance. If we think about right now, for example, the recycling of batteries, right? Uh, we have recycling information within the battery passport. So at the end of its life, if a battery comes to a recycler, right now it's kind of a black box. We don't know what's in there. Is it screwed? Is it glued? Is it lasered? We don't know. Um, the information in the battery passport can help with that. And then, of course, uh, this can can go up actually to um, to design, to, to intelligent battery design. We can bring it back to the beginning when we actually produce uh, batteries. Another example would be the dynamic data points that we have in the battery passport. For example, state of health, state of charge, um, uh, charging cycles. All this also can be used in uh, more intelligent usage of the battery if we have all of this knowledge. So definitely, I think this can be improved by the knowledge that we have accumulated and then even be brought back to, to production uh, of batteries. Allow me la one last question. I think this minute is there. What is the next step you expect politics and companies to take to really reach a tipping point here? So. Uh, for, from our perspective, the next step is, of course, to look for a solution provider, reach out to us, <laughs> Siemens Battery Passport product team. I mean, uh, I think I mentioned that before. It is really crucial because it's not going to be done and solved by the economic operator himself. So he really needs to become active, activate the supply chain, look for a solution, look for, for um, an ecosystem that can help uh, asset, administra asset administration shell, but also Katina X standards that are being set and kind of really uh, yeah, get going the, the, the collaboration and, and start looking into it because it's right around the corner. So have to act now, I would say. Yeah. So Thank you all just for a great this panel. Of oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I 100% um, can underline this act now. And I think what is now happening is that all these concepts pick up more and more speed. And there are already providers like, for example, also VS Fraunhofer Jese, 
who are providing, for example, a data space, an AS data space as a service. And this drastically lowers the entry barrier if you would like to try this out. Because then if you use these services that we are providing, you don't need to set up all this fancy infrastructure and figure out how to integrate this in your IT system. No, instead you can very easily approach us, set this up as a service and get going, get a feeling in a test bed where you can't do anything wrong and collect lots of experiences. Now we're really running out of time, so thank <laughs> you for a really great panel and an optimistic outlook. Thank you.